The Lord be with you. Reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, conversing with him. Then Peter said to Jesus in reply, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud cast a shadow over them. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell prostrate, and they were very much afraid. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise, do not be afraid. And when the disciples raised their eyes, they saw no one else but Jesus alone. As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, Do not tell the vision to anyone until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. A very interesting scientific fact is that the average person blinks 25 times a minute. It's also scientifically verifiable that the average blink lasts about a fifth of a second. What this means is that if you were to take a 10-hour car trip driving 50 miles an hour, you would drive 50 miles of that trip with your eyes closed. Now, aren't you glad you guys came here today? Where else can you get deep spiritual insights like this? You know, but hidden in that spiritual, not spiritual, that scientific statistic is an important truth about our life. In life, we see things very clearly. But there are also other things which we do not see, to which our eyes are shut. And much like the experience of blinking, we are largely unaware of those things that we do not see, of the things to which our eyes are closed. Now this is what makes the transfiguration in today's gospel so important for the disciples. They thought they knew Jesus. They ate with him. They watched him heal people. They traveled with him. They heard him preach. Yet they were so very unaware of how much of Jesus they did not see. In the transfiguration, they receive a glimpse of Jesus' glory, a flash of his brilliance that they normally did not see. In the transfiguration, they were confronted with the mystery of Jesus' death and resurrection, which they had not even begun to anticipate. The transfiguration told the disciples that Jesus was more than they had ever imagined him to be. And as much as they knew about him, there was so much more they did not know. This experience of the transfiguration, I think, provides for us a model of discipleship. In our lives, we have to have wisdom to claim and see those things that we can that are visible. But at the same time, we must have humility to remember that there are many things that we do not see. And we must never forget the sheer wonder of our faith. The model for discipleship, then, is a combination of wisdom, humility, and wonder. Wisdom to know what is visible, humility to remember that there's even more that we do not understand, and a wonder at the supernatural aspect of our faith. Do you ever wonder why the Transfiguration reading is in Lent? It's kind of an Easter story in some ways. But the church gives it to us every second Sunday in Lent, no matter what the year is. We hear it from Matthew today. In a year from now, on the second Sunday of Lent, we'll hear it from Luke, and then we'll hear it from Mark in the third. But why? Why the Transfiguration story? I think there's three reasons. One, it's a reminder for us to remember 
the wisdom of why we engage in our Lenten disciplines. They're not there to make us miserable. Our fasting, our penance, our almsgiving, they're there to make us holy. You know, several guys from the parish are doing a program called Exodus 90. It's a challenging prospect. It's thir- thir- or 90 days of some very disciplined activities. No using your phone unless it's for work. No watching movies. Taking cold showers. Whew. Now there's also a, an Exodus 40, which is during Lent, which some of us are doing, and you're allowed to take warm showers. So can you imagine which one I'm doing? I'm, I'm doing the, yeah, I'm doing the 40-day one. Father Mike is doing the 90-day one. So <laughs> the first thing that Exodus asks you, though, before you enter into these disciplines, is what is your why? Why are you going to do this? Why are you going to do some extra fasting and give up some things in a, in a very disciplined why? why? Why are you going to do this? What is your why? That is a really good question to ask during Lent. Why are you doing the things that you're doing? Why are you praying? Why are you fasting? Why do we come to, to receive the Sacrament of Reconciliation on Wednesday? What is your why during Lent? Transfiguration also reminds us to be humble. You know, our lives are built on the shoulders of people who have gone before us in faith. People who shared with us the gospel. And we see that in the Transfiguration story where Moses and Elijah show up. We also see that in our own lives. Even as we celebrate this season of Lent, you know, Lent was promulgated by the bishops at the Council of Nicaea in 325. This was at a time when when those bishops had gone through immense persecution for their faith. Some of them showed up for the council mutilated by their bodies. Some were missing limbs. Some were blind. They had been persecuted and tortured so much for their faith. Yet they gathered together at Nicaea. They gave us the Nicaean Creed. They also gave us this wonderful season of Lent. Who are the people in your life whose faith you stand upon? who prayed for you, who walked with you, who perhaps were your sponsors during your sacraments. We need to remember those people of faith. And the transfiguration belongs in Lent because it reminds us of that divine glory revealed in that story of the transfiguration. It reminds us, help it by our Lenten practices, that ours is a faith of miracles. I don't know if you've heard about what's going on at Asbury University in Kentucky. It's in Wilmore, Kentucky. It's a Methodist university, ecumenical, there's Catholics, Protestants there. But they have chapel every day. And on Wednesday, February 8th, last month, they went through their chapel service. They ended with a praise and worship song. And then students continued praying. And they continued worshiping God all through the day, all through the night. All through the next day and the next night, students continued to just spontaneously pray and worship God, and the Holy Spirit showed up. And students started just just confessing sins that they were struggling with. They were praying for one another. Father Norm Fisher is the pastor of St. Peter Claver Church in nearby Lexington, Kentucky, and he heard about what was going on. And so he finished the Mass at noon on Sunday February 12th, a couple weeks ago, and he went over to Asbury to see what was going on. He had students from his congregation that attended school there that were telling him about it. Father Fisher said, hands were raised, people were singing, and all were in one accord. It reminded me of Psalm 133.1, in which the psalmist declares how good and pleasant it is when the brothers dwell together in one. This spontaneous outpouring of praise and worship of God lasted for two weeks, 24 hours a day. It was amazing to see. I was really captivated by that story. Because when I went to college, in Wheaton College, back in the the 80s, when I sat beside, behind Jesus in the third grade, that's how old I am. Um, (laughs) I remember a time of worship and, and prayer that the Holy Spirit just took over. And for three days, students stayed in our chapel just praising God. And it was, it was beautiful to see that revival. 
Now, I've also read the media reports that have said, you know, this is group hallucination. This is cultish. This is mass hysteria. The world that doesn't recognize the divine or the supernatural will never understand the wonder and awe that we have in our faith. We believe in miracles. A miracle that Jesus is going to show up here in the form of bread and wine. We believe in the miracle of the transfiguration. We believe at times when revival strikes and the Holy Spirit pours out and heals people. We believe that the Blessed Mother comes and appears. We believe in the miracles of Fatima. We believe in the miracles of Lourdes. We believe the Cavs can defeat the Celtics tomorrow. No, that's just way, that's sorry. <laughs> the Blessed Mother's going to have to show up for that one if the Cavs are going to win. But, uh, but our faith is filled with wonder, and we have to remember that. The challenge, though, is we live between two mountains, the Mount Tabor of the Transfiguration. And in a few weeks, we're going to be hearing about the Mount of Olives and the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus prays for this cup to pass, where there is anxiety, where there is that future of the horrible passion and suffering that he is going to go through. Those are the two mountains we live between. And we have experiences sometimes on retreat or sometimes when we're praying before the Blessed Sacrament of that transfiguration we feel so close to God. And yet we also have times of suffering and times of difficulty where we're also very close to that Mount of Olives. Those are the two mountains we live between. But Jesus doesn't call us to do that by ourselves. He gives us the presence of his Blessed Mother. He gives us the, the saints. He gives us one another. That's why I asked you at the start of Mass to offer up a prayer intention, something that you can hold for somebody else during the season of Lent and pray for that brother or sister because we are not on this journey of faith alone. Jesus sent us down from the mountain, but he doesn't send us down alone. So pray for one another. Pray for your brother. Pray for your sister. In faith, hold that prayer close and keep your eyes open to the wisdom, to the humility, and to that divine glory of our faith.